Hello. Guys, first off, I'm out of breath from worshiping because I'm out of shape. But secondly, I'm excited. I'm excited to be back here. Who was here last year um, when we joined? Like 18 people. That's great. Um, it was cool. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to come. Um, P.S. This is a side note. I really appreciated the enthusiasm for the LSU Tiger tie. Can we say national champions? It's no big deal, but we're the best and we're superior. <laughs> it's not a big thing. Um, also, a little hoop for Atlanta. Who are my Atlanta people? That's real. Um, I am excited, though, last year when we came, first off, I was wildly pregnant, so had that baby. Uh, he's precious. He's so cute. He's got the biggest dimples. He's just joy wrapped in a sausage casing. He's so fat, and it's the best. Um, but I'm not pregnant anymore, but I do feel pregnant with, like, expectation and with excitement and with um, the weight of the word that God has for you guys today, because it's heavy. I want to brace you for that. But I feel like we broke the ice last year, because if you were here last year, I shared a bit of my testimony. Um, if you weren't, uh, it's great. We lead with the high school, the soccer, the athletic stuff. But uh, I was also raised up in the church, um, really a faith by inheritance. Could have told you a lot about God, didn't know God, struggled with eating disorder, went off to college, lost my dad to suicide freshman year, struggled with anxiety, depression, promiscuity. Um, we talked all about last year struggles with promiscuity, with, with porn addiction, um, with adultery even being a part of my story in another couple's life, and a lot of sexual brokenness, and then ultimately a lot of of grace and glory and goodness of the gospel that changed and shifted everything. So last year was powerful, and we broke the ice there, and if you weren't there then, that might have, uh, and you probably feel uncomfortable. But you're going to get more uncomfortable, so enjoy it. Um, I want to pray before we start, because God's given me a, a, a deep word, and I'm going to need to talk fast to cover everything that he shared, and it's going to seem hard portions of it, but I find more and more that the things that are hard are what are holy. And so we need to prepare ourselves and put a fence aside for like 40 minutes to allow God to minister in the way he wants to minister to your heart, knowing that it is hard, but it is holy. It is purely rooted out of the love of God. He disciplines those whom he loves. He draws near to those who draw near to him. He's not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your angst and your confusion. He wants the messy. But we, in a Christian college, and often as believers who have been walking in the faith for a while, convince or are deceived to believe that we need to have it all figured out and all together, and we can't wrestle anymore, and we can't really ask the questions. In fact, we are supposed to know all the answers. And in reality, many of us go back to our dorm rooms or to our bedroom or our homes and at the end of the day are the ones known for knowing and loving Christ and yet feel distant from God. And we're doing a lot for God. But are we being with God? Do we know God? Are we known by God? Is there actual intimacy? in your relationship with God. And they're not separate. The sex talk, the, the talk of intimacy with God. In fact, the physical prophesies of the Spirit is the manifestation of what's happening in the Spirit. So if you connected with the talk last year about the sexual brokenness, if that's a part of your story right now, it's probably because what is manifesting in the physical is great evidence of what is desperately lacking in the spiritual. Because we say as Christians, right, it's relationship, not religion. Praise God for great. It's relationship, not religion. Yet we don't even know how to have healthy relationships. So all of our relationships are broken or confused. A lot of the time it roots out of fatherlessness. Hello, that was a big part of my story. Y'all, I'm 30 years old and sometimes I still wake up in my faith and fear like, God, please don't leave. Please don't leave. Don't go away from me. Like, I, I heard you so clearly yesterday and we communed. Remember, you're not going to leave, are you? I'm a grown woman. I'm married with kids. I'm an adult. 
And I wake up like a trembling child sometimes because my father put a gun to his heart and bailed when life got kind of tough. Talk about it being hard to get vulnerable before the Heavenly Father. Many of us don't even know what a, a, a father who stays even looks like. Or we have brokenness um, in our families. We have fatherlessness. In some degree, we've suffered abandonment. In many degrees, we've navigated friendships, and those have turned out all wrong and all off, and we've been wounded by people we've trusted. And a lot of this sits at the root and then manifests out as well in how our relationships physically play out. Because we've been wounded and hurt, we don't even know what it looks like. It has not been modeled for us a healthy relationship. We claim like relationship, not religion, but really we just want the stamp of Christ follower as if that does something for your reputation and actually you don't really want to know Christ or you're not sure even how to in this space and then it manifests in the fact that in our relationships moving forward we are just as broken as the world we're sexually promiscuous we're struggling with porn we don't want connection we just want the quick fix we don't know how to navigate friendships well. We don't know how to treat each other with honor and dignity. We don't really often know how to bear one another's burdens like we just sung about because that's messy and hard and hurts and she's a lot. That's like how my assistant probably feels towards me. It, you don't want to be in our home office. I'm dramatic and people are and that's okay. <laughs> But Christ came that we would know him and be known by him, that we would be set apart from the world, that we would be a picture of the restoration of true relationship. That the world would look and see something that they're lacking and that they long for and that we could share of the glory and the goodness and the love of God. But because a lot of us are wanting to just dodge this step of intimacy with God, just take the title and move forward. Just work, 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 and do, do, do. We're Martha's, are we not? What does scripture say? And let me find it. Let me think. Luke 10, 38 through 42, the story of Martha and Mary. Do you know what's really interesting to me in that passage is that Jesus gives us permission to worry and to stress, to concern ourselves with something. Mary's busy doing, performing, preparing, making a way, so busy. Are we not also doing for the Lord, making sure people see our good thing? We're performing, we're trying. We are performance-based, hoping we'll earn the love of a father. And he says, Martha, because she says, rebuke Mary. Lazy. I need help. He's like, Martha, if there's anything, let me find the actual scripture. Read it more clearly. You're worried and upset over all these details, but there is one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. And so when I look to that passage, what I see is Jesus giving explicit permission. Hey, if you're going to stress about anything, if you're going to worry about anything, if you're going to be concerned about anything, let it be the priority of you finding your place at my feet and sitting and listening to me and communing with me and knowing me. I don't know, though. I have like a really busy class schedule and then I have sports practice and then I have... The, the guy who I really want to be my boyfriend, but honestly, it just I don't even know what it is currently, but he said we could go out and a meal. He might treat me to a meal. This is exciting. No, he made me pay. It's a lot. It's complicated. We're just friends, but it's really confusing. But it's fine. And then I need to like do this and do that and make sure this and make sure that. And then I get all the DMs. Y'all reach out to other leaders as if these these... Christian leaders in the faith or someone with followers on social media is the voice you care to hear from rather than the voice of your good shepherd asking, give me some insight, give me some wisdom. How do I find time for God? Um, if there's anything you should be concerned about, it's how you're going to find time for life in light of the amount of time you spend at God's feet. That we would give him our first fruits. That he would be our ultimate priority. That knowing this intimacy with him, this communion with him is of utmost importance. That I can even go out and be productive and constructive and be fruitful as he's designed me to be. 
I haven't even prayed yet. Y'all, I gotta go in. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the word that you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation that you give us. Thank you, God, that your word says we can be so anointed solely by your Holy Spirit that we need not to even be taught. Lord, you are our teacher. You give us the bread of life in your word when we are hungry. You give us living water when we thirst. We are made to commune with you. God, what's unique to you is that you, by your son, Lord, allow divinity to exist within us, these broken vessels, and bring what's broken back to life. God, would you do it today? Would you take these words that you have for us, would you translate them to each ear, each mind, each heart in this room, God, and would you speak into their story? Lord, would you reveal yourself more to us? We want nothing more than you. We just want you. God, reveal to us what you have to say to us about that truth. Meet us in the heart with a holy touch of comfort and of love. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember um, coming across this passage of scripture when I was really young in the faith and like brushing past it because it's confusing and it was like, I didn't understand what it was talking about and it also was terrifying to me and also we usually just trek over ground that actually needs excavating because it's easy to just kind of do the Christian thing. But I remember coming across this scripture then and coming across it again more recently and something more recently just had it nest itself in my spirit and like I could not escape the words and the thought and the weight because I didn't understand it. And God reminded me that he's worth the investigation. Matthew seven twenty one through 23 says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, workers of lawlessness. I think I probably could have like kept doing the thing I was doing of stuffing down or walking past the confusing stuff, even though that expression, I never knew you, was weighing on me like a ton of bricks. Because I was on stage, I was going, I was speaking, I was doing, I was, in many ways, these people crying out, Lord, do you not see what we're doing for you, what we've done in your name? This isn't the non-believer and the believer he's speaking to. These are those who profess him as Lord with their lips. And they stand before him and they argue their good works. Didn't you see all the things we did for you, Lord? And his response is, okay, but I never knew you. What did that mean? It like hung on me and it wasn't long after until I came across Matthew 25, 1 through 4, that's speaking of the 10 virgins, the 10 bridesmaids. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil in their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise, the others replied, Girl, I don't have enough for you. Um, They said it more politely. We don't have enough for all of us. No, they didn't. They were quite blind. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. (laughs) but while they were gone to buy oil do y'all know how tired women get of you asking for what's in their purse like do you have gum I did it to somebody when I got here like do you have a mint we just really want to say like I don't have enough for you I brought this supply for me 
back off. While they were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. I never knew you. I do not know you. These words were like, I couldn't get them out of my head and my spirit. And I don't want to be one of the foolish. And I don't want to be one of the doers who missed being with God. So what did this mean as I was looking to my word and you actually look to the hard parts of the word that we don't understand? I just asked God, what are you saying here? You, you're saying in Matthew 25, there's a differentiation between the wise and the foolish. So we can see again, just like in the other scripture of Matthew, this is not the believers and the non-believers, the, the, the Christians and the atheists. And he's saying to the atheists, sorry, these are referencing the body of Christ, those who would profess with their lips and call him Lord. We'd be wise to remember, Scripture says, many profess with their lips, but we must also be justified of the heart. So this is speaking of those who to some degree had stepped away from the world and were awaiting Christ. To some degree were calling him Lord with their lips. But they were foolish and they were wise and I was desperate to know what this meant. And when I looked to the word, what it distinguished, the difference between the two was that the wise brought with them extra vessels of oil. So I'm like, what's the oil? Where do I buy it? What is it? I need to know that I'm carrying the extra vessel of oil because I don't know the day or the hour of your return. And frankly, in this culture, in this world, it is really hard to wait on you, God. There are days I talk myself out, really, of, of certain elements of your truth. I'm like, well, this is 2,000 years ago, and they said they're in the end times, and these returning sin, and here we are. And things are getting worse and more broken and more confusing. And I need to know, God, that I know what you mean by this. And so I just asked him. Y'all know you can do that, right? Just literally ask God your question. It's kind of a mark of the cool nature of the Holy Spirit within you. He'll speak or he'll move or he'll draw you to truth or he'll send confirmation or he'll respond. I think he delights. Does he not say like, ask, seek, you'll find? So anywho, what's the oil? And I also started thinking, where had I heard something significant of oil before? And I remembered a sermon that I had heard several years ago that taught on the Garden of Gethsemane. Because Gethsemane is an Aramaic, in Aramaic this word means olive press. And I stood in there. I stood in the Garden of Gethsemane in Israel. And it is an olive grove of trees. This is the place where olives grew and the place that they were pressed so their oil could be extracted. This was what the Garden of Gethsemane, the purpose it served. And Gethsemane means this olive press. And so here in this place is where olives were pressed so the oil could drip and drain out of them. And here too in this place is where Christ was pressed to the point of sweating blood pressed to the point of blood drawn from him saying, Father, is there any other way? This is the place Christ came, moved away from those who he walked with, whom he loved. Some of y'all need to know it's okay. You can have a relationship with God too, apart from your small group. That's not the only place you go for fuel, for food. He separated, said, y'all keep watch. I need to commune with my father. And in this place, in Gethsemane, he is pressed, aware of what must take place in order for God's plan to be fulfilled, aware of the pain that would bring, aware of the excruciating measure of what it truly meant to obey the father. Pressed here in his blood, 
was shed. And so as I was thinking of that, this place of great mental and spiritual suffering for Christ, I was drawn to Leviticus 24, 2, where it speaks of oil. Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Okay, I'm seeing lamps, I'm seeing oil, I'm seeing the pressing, I'm seeing Gethsemane, I'm seeing Jesus. What are you saying? And what he revealed to me like a wave, like a revelation is he goes, do you know what makes you wise? What will fill your extra vessel with oil? Because the oil is the outpouring of my Holy Spirit. The oil is what you need to continue to keep your lamp burning as you walk through these days that are hard and confusing and broken and relationships are tough and sin is rampant and things are dark. If you want to walk through these days with consistency, sober-minded, never distracted, never deceived, to keep your lamp burning, you must carry extra oil. And I'm like, then what does that mean? Where do I go? What are you saying? And he said, the oil for the wise is accumulated in the pressing, unseen, hidden place. I haven't seen you there in a while. And I was like... (laughs) I have three kids. I'm really busy. And also, I'm trying to maintain a home and my family. And then I'm speaking. I'm traveling. I'm doing things for you, God. And he's like, I haven't seen you there in a while. And he reminded me of a prophetic word that he gave me back when I was, I like track time by humans. I've um, yielded. And so I had one child. And I was in the kitchen of my home, just like, burnout, tapped out, overwhelmed. And I remember just like slumping to the kitchen floor at one point. And I was like, God, I don't even know what's going on. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not cut out for this. Why have you entrusted me with it? I have so many things going on. And it was in that kitchen, in that place that he simply whispered, I do holy work in quiet caves. I was pregnant with my second at the time, and he said, in the quiet cave of your womb, I'm knitting life together with purpose, with grandeur, every detail. Was it not the quiet cave in the shepherd's field in Israel where I brought the Savior of the world into existence? No, it wasn't. It was a stable, and there were tame livestock. They were waiting, panting, thirsting for God Almighty to be born into their midst. (laughs) No, go to Israel! The shepherds kept their flocks in caves. They stayed cool in the summer, warm in the winter. They're all throughout shepherd's field. It was in the back of one of these caves. We walked into it that Mary, a 13 or 14 year old young girl would have labored in pain, likely with the help of shepherd's wives to birth forth the savior of the world in a quiet, unseen, hidden place. I do holy work in quiet caves. This home you feel trapped in, these lives I've given you to disciple and raise up, I'm doing holy work in this quiet cave. Shouldn't I tell Instagram about all that holy work, though, so that people like it and see it? He's like, no, why don't you just let me do holy work in quiet caves? (sighs) The oil signifies an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the pressed Christ. And in order to accumulate, to acquire that oil, to walk through these days with our lamp burning, we must be willing to voluntarily be pressed alongside him in the quiet places. If you allow yourself to know the pressing of God, you will allow yourself to know the overflow of oil. You won't read that scripture and be afraid. What does he mean? I don't know you. You'll say, well, praise God, because I know him and he knows me like nothing I can even describe. When I say relationship, it's not the masturbatory faith of give me the high in a worship service and then I do my thing. Give me the rush. I need to seek what the new person's saying. I need to feel something and the good and anything that feels bad just must be rebuked in Jesus' name. No, God gives and takes away. He disciplines those he loves. He wants to press you in the unseen place so that he can tend to and draw out that which is not of him. He wants to refine you in the fire. And we run from anything uncomfortable in the spiritual and we do the same in our actual relationships. 
the quick thing of let me get my rush, let me get my want, let me surround myself with yes people who are yesing you right into your demise. No, I want to be surrounded by true intimacy. No one really modeled it for me in my life until I married and came to know intimacy with my husband. That's deep, it's abiding, it's everlasting, it stays. When things are hard, when things are messy, when things are vulnerable, when things are exposed, intimacy doesn't say, okay, tired of bearing your burdens, figure it out on your own. Intimacy stays. And it says, I'll carry that burden with you. I'll lift that weight with you. This is pressing. This is overwhelming. You're seeing in me things that I don't really like. But we're staying in this together. And y'all are lacking deep friendships. And you're lacking healthy relationships. And you're lacking restoration that Christ wants to bring to your family and your home. And you're lacking intimacy with God which catalysts all of these things. Because first off, you just don't have the time to get in the pressing place. And second off, when you get in there and things start to get a little tense and he starts pointing out that sin struggle within you or that wound that you're better off ignoring or that lust that you're wrestling with or that greed or that slander and that gossip that just came through your phone the second you sat down and were killing time, or any of the things that are defiling you and repulsive to him, when he starts saying, all right, I'm Jehovah Rapha, the great physician. We're going to work these things out. It's going to hurt. I'm going to press you here, but it's for your, glo- for your good and for my glory. As soon as we get into that pressing, we're like, and I'm out, and I bail. And that doesn't feel good, and I don't like that. And you know what? That's really hard on my self-confidence. And it's maybe just more self-care that's needed here because something's uncomfortable, Carol. What's uncomfortable is you've been enslaved to the same sin for a decade of your life, and you won't let God press it forth and press it out and draw it up. We claim to want to be like Christ, yes? that the Holy Spirit would be in us to transform us into the image of Christ. Well, the Christ I saw got pressed to the point of drawing blood in the garden. The Christ I know took a cross and stayed, even when it hurt, even when it was hard, even when it was messy. What did he say in the first Matthew scriptures? Not all who call out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father. Okay, that must be the things. That's what I thought. The things we do, the will of God, the actions and the service. But he goes on to say, the people argue the actions of the servants. He's like, no, you're not getting it. That's not it. The will of the Father is that you would know him, be known by him, have intimacy with his divinity and that it would transform everything in your life. He's not a branch fixer. He's an uprooter. You're enslaved to something, sin or the sun. He's not, you can't free float well freedom and it's all grace and it's all freedom. And so those who are free are free indeed. And I'm going to pervert that scripture to think that freedom means whatever I want it to. Freedom means enslavement to Christ. Paul speaks of it. I don't like those words. Enslavement seem heavy. It's like an interesting time to use that phrase. Freedom means enslavement and humility and submission and obedience to the one who, when your roots move into that righteous soil, will bring life and bear fruit and show his glory to a world that is blind and desperately needing sight. A tree can't exist if it's free-floating. You're in some kind of soil. He's an uprooter and a replanter into righteousness. And by way of that, to claim we want the pressed Christ, we will submit to the pressing of God that is so hard and so holy. Sanctification. It's the work of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is not your, your, your genie to serve you the high when you need a hit. The Holy Spirit is your advocate and also your convictor. 
I don't like conviction. I don't like it. I don't like that word. I don't even like the thoughts. Get her off stage. Who let the woman come speak? I don't feel it. I don't know it. I know that I opened my computer screen and I'm struggling with an addiction to porn and that it often feels, oh, why is it still this woman? It's, I'm, let me take it out. I don't feel like Debbie in Alabama would be wrestling with these same things. But for a college age student, you know the sin you're wrestling with. You know what's pressing you and drawing you far from the Father. He's like, look up. Love me. I want intimacy. But I'm not your touch and go, convenient, when you need type relationship. I'm your God. I want to make you into the image of my Son, to transform you, to heal you, to make you whole. But you've got to stay long enough for, to even hear my voice. You've got to pick up this word, this living, breathing word of life that's collecting dust on your bedside table because you'd rather hear the way Stephen Furtick can rhyme words. You've got to know the word. Sorry, Stephen's a great pastor. I just, it's like everything is rhyming. <laughs> it's a talent. But Stephen Furtick won't be standing next to you when you stand before the Father. You'll be standing alone. And here's what I feel. I don't want to fear that because fear means that perfect love has not been made complete in my heart. So I refuse to live a life in which I fear one day when I stand before the Father, I'm not sure what I will hear. I want to live a life that literally lays prostrate at his feet so that when I am before him, this is a familiar position. I'm not scared of you, God. I just know my place before you. And it looks a whole lot like this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with your glory. I am yours. You are mine. And it's in this posture that he lifts up his children. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Allow for the pressing and he will fill your vessel. Seek to know him and you will know for sure the rock of your salvation. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. This is Mark 14, 36. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. These are Jesus' words in Gethsemane. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. If Matthew 7 says those who he knows are those who do the will of the Father, then to know God is to know that his will is the way, not yours. But he says, you will have no God before me, and that means not even the God you've made of yourself and your emotions and your wants and your discomfort and your offense and your sensitivity and your likes and your opinions. He wants to destroy that idol. Press us in the unseen place and to lift us up like the resurrected Christ to move in power and in true freedom, and in true efficiency and effectiveness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. His will is for our pressing, and his will is for intimacy, because all works are born out of his spirit, out of intimacy, all works that are worth anything. The question is, do you want intimacy? Do you want intimacy with the Father? Do you want intimacy with Christ? Do you want intimacy with the Holy Spirit, with a triune God who is dynamic and who is powerful and who is glorious and who has poured out himself for us to know? Do you want the title of Christian and a degree from a Christian university or do you want the saving grace of Christ and a fearless, bold, confident life of faith that shines his light with a lamp that has no risk of going out. Because when things were hard, I knew my quiet cave, and you gave me answer. When things were confusing, I knew my quiet cave, and you brought clarity. When things were convicting, I knew my quiet cave, and you drew out in me what was defiling to you, and repentance became a rhythm of my life. 
I don't like repentance either. She's talking conviction and she's talking repentance and that's uncomfortable because the work is complete. The work of the cross is complete, yes, but there are active verbs in the New Testament that mean you co-labor with Christ in this process, that you throw off that which so easily entangles you, that you flee from sexual immorality, that you deny the flesh so that your spirit can rise. And I don't know about y'all, and I don't know if you'll pick it up and carry it, but I'll tell you what, for the rest of my days, I will know the still pressing, crushing place. I will discover intimacy. And I'll feel the pain in the unseen place with a perfect father who loves me because that pain is more bearable to me than the confusion of a hypocritical walk feeling like my God is somehow formed in the image of my earthly father who failed me. Will you leave? Are you going to bail? Am I in in the end? Do you choose me? Do you not? Do you love me? Do you not? If those questions go through your mind, find yourself in your prayer closet and ask him. And if intimacy is bewildering to you and no relationship in your life looks healthy, please step away from wounding other people in the process of you trying to find the love your heart is longing for. And please find your way into your prayer closet. Men of God, stop dragging along the women of God. Women of God, stop selling yourselves short for the deception of the enemy. Get here and let him raise you up as women and men of God, filled with an indwelling fire of the Holy Spirit that cannot go out because I've got vessel on vessel on vessel. <sighs> Intimacy is hard, but it's holy. And we're in a culture and a world that doesn't understand it. And it's why relational brokenness is rampant. We really don't have many models of it done well, um, except we have one of it done perfectly. Eat from the bread of life and drink living water. And he will show you the way and the truth. And you will know him and be known by him and look forward to the day you stand before him, not fear it. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. God, I thank you for who you are that you're such a mystery to us. Lord, I love that your word is living and breathing and active and alive, and I love that your Holy Spirit is burning within us a flame that will not go out. Lord, you promise us you will never leave us nor forsake us, God. So humble us in the revelation that if we feel far from you, it is not because you have bailed, but rather because we have likely been the distant one in the relationship. God, draw us into the quiet caves. Draw us into the holy, hidden, unseen places. Lord, let your light shine into them that darkness would be dispelled. Let the pressing become a posture that purifies us. We want intimacy with you, so teach us, God. Holy Spirit, teach us and lead us in the way we should go. In your perfect and holy and matchless name, amen. Thank you, guys.